And we are live, or we are recording, whichever way you want to think about it. Uh, welcome, everybody, uh, to Almond, New Jersey's Pitching and IG Strategy. My name is Jackie Cheslow, and I am the current VP of Professional Development for the New Jersey chapter. You're in for an absolute treat today. Um, this is, these are two of my favorite speakers, but before we get started, I just want to touch on a couple of housekeeping um, issues. First, we'd ask you to keep yourself on mute unless you're speaking. Uh, keep the background noise down as much as possible, and particularly since we're recording. So um, you'll have access to the recording afterwards, and it, it just makes for better quality. Um, if you have questions during the session, put them in the chat, and I will raise them with Anne and Marco. Um, we will have an open Q&A at the end of the session where you can jump in and ask any other questions that didn't come up during the session. A little bit different this time around. At the end of the session, we're going to stay live um, until 2.30 so that we have time for some informal networking. Um, most Some of the Almond New Jersey board will be there. Um, Chris Bednar, uh, the Northeast Region Director, is there. Uh, if you have any questions for us about either the presentation for Ann and Marco Armour in general or Armour, New Jersey, we're happy to answer them. If you have any questions about us, you got that too. So without further ado, um, let me briefly introduce our speakers and they'll tell you much more about themselves when they get started. So Anne is a uh, past New Jersey chapter president and an ardent Armour, New Jersey and Armour supporter. Uh, she's the sole proprietor of her own technology, legal technology solutions consulting firm an IG strategist and a frequent speaker on a variety of IG topics. Joining us today also is Marco Maggio. Marco is the VP of Strategic Practices for Konica Minolta and also a frequent IG speaker and a strategist, particularly um, uh, well-versed in cloud, legal, finance, education, and healthcare practices. And I'm sure all of you will join me in welcoming Anne and Marco today. I'll turn the program over to the two of you. Oh, perfect. Thank you so much, Jackie. And 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 I, for those of you that saw, um, I, when I posted, I said, I called this fun with friends. And um, besides being with my friends from my new Army New Jersey board and all of you who I would consider friends just for joining us in today, Marco and I met a number of years ago, um, I want to say maybe at an ILTA conference. I don't, I don't know where we were, but we became like, you know, instant, instant uh, friends. And uh, we would always say, why aren't we talking together? Why don't, why aren't we ever on a panel together? And I said, I'm making sure we're on panels together. So we finally got ourselves to do that. Um, and I'm not going to read a lot of this, you know, you're going to get this handout and you can go find out what you'd like to find out. But Marco, maybe why don't you just kind of just say like, you know, your 15 second pitch. Sure thing. Uh, for, for me, it's kind of interesting and I, I love making the pitch. My my career dances in and out of sales leadership and, and strategy leadership. So it's always about uh, not only being able to execute the ideas, but to come up with some creative and innovative ideas and be able to literally persuade the, uh, the powers that be that my ideas are the best ideas. So it's really interesting when we, when we do presentations like this. And Ann, where we met, I'm not sure where it was, but I'm sure there was a bar involved. Um, <laughs> Usually, usually. <laughs> we get done with whatever it is we're doing and they're like we're, we're, let's get out of here Let, like let's get out of here let's move on so um, i can there's a number of stories there's a number of great stories um, there's actually been tears involved in many of our stories but um <laughs> we were both involved um and 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 to you know to marco's point you know and, and I've, I've had a bunch of different you know different roles in, in arma in Arma, New Jersey, and I'm very pleased. I, you know, I met a lot of great people through that Arma experience. Um, so uh, my 15 seconds pitch is, you know, I work with law firms and corporate legal departments. I'm usually in what we call, uh, I used to call them SMB, small to mid-sized business, but some of my clients get offended that you call them small. So I've learned a new term called MMR, called um, mid-market regional. And they like that term, because then it sounds like really important. Um, and, and I work with them in a change management role and in, 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 in an information governance advisory role. How do I get that project over the fence? Um, and if you were on listening to us chat before my entire life, I've been, but why? <laughs> but why can't we do this? And so that's kind of been my whole role. My whole life is asking the question, but why? I think we can do this, but why? So um, that's kind of why I'm glad that we've had this. This is a blend of a couple of presentations that Marco's given that I've given those of you that know Nick Inglis I had given a 
presentation about how to give a talk to the CEO, you know, the C-suite. This is a combination of, of something I saw Marco give. So he gave something for Arm in New Jersey on um, strategies and, and um, what was that one? We, we, we did it in form. What do we call that? Um, value so proposition. Um, it was yes. value proposition. So I think of Princeton, yes. Yeah, it was in Princeton when we were in Princeton. So we're going to talk today about how do you give that message? How do you get your information governance message over the fence and some of the things that you need to do? And it starts with being an effective communicator. So I'm going to turn this part over to Marco. We'll tag team back and forth. But some of you look at the two of us and say, oh, it's so easy for you. You do this. We don't do it without practice. We don't do it without having practice it doesn't just some of us are a little more outspoken and extroverts and introverts extroverted introverts introverted extroverts i think both of marco and i are both extroverted extroverts um <laughs> but it, it's it's not a science it's not an art it's really a combination of the two and a lot of practice marco yeah i definitely agree i mean presenting to the executive level whether it's a concept or an idea it is a balancing act and you know as ann said it's and it's about equal parts between art and science and you know, there's so much that Ann and I can share with you on the topic, but we don't have eight weeks to teach a course. Uh, we have the better part of an hour, so we're going to focus on the highlights and really some of the basic concepts for you. But let me start by stating two basic goals you're trying to get from any pitch. You want to maximize engagement and retention from your audience. It's important, engagement and retention. There are several strategies Ann and I are going to discuss today to help you increase both engagement and retention. Uh, today, we're going to cover how to adjust your audience, communication styles, preparation tips, and then how to execute that flawless pitch, which leads me to the little tip that I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell, that I'd like to steal from Aristotle, and that's tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them what you, tell, I'm sorry, <laughs> tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, then tell them what you told them. So today, as I said, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of jump around from some of the communication styles and personality styles, uh, and then get into how to execute that perfect pitch for yourself. Uh, so, you know, when, when, you, when you look at this, there's, really critical to understand your audience and that's where you're going to adapt and you're going to adjust and and you kind of look at what's what, what's on the screen here those top four boxes um, those are really around a a director's style um, and it's very important to, to understand these concepts when we talk about communication style so i'm, I'm going to use one but what i want you to walk away with is how to understand your audience how to cater the way that you communicate we started to allude to earlier, words matter and, and how you portray that message, what you communicate. And it all helps you increase that engagement and retention that we talked about earlier of the critical information you're trying to relay or to get that desired action you're after. So with, with this chart, just understand that typical people live in multiple boxes. Generally, they have a primary communication style. Um, if you look at this top four box I mentioned, that's, that's a director with, within the matrix. And a director's style is to assume Quick action and decisiveness yield the best results. Uh, they're traditionally hard chargers, and they frame the world as a competitive place of action and decisiveness. If you look in the, the top right-hand box, that charmer, entertainer, diplomat, socializer, they make up the director. Director's style is to assume the quick action and, 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 and decisiveness also. Uh, I'm sorry, expressor. Let me get back to expressor. They're, they're, they're in the top right-hand corner. Um, they like to lead through their creative ideas. They're also assertive, just like the director. They're also people oriented, they say it like it is, and they think their team should feel free to voice their opinions. They think outside of the box and they articulate what they feel. These are generally, as it says in the top right hand corner, the most dominant part, there are entertainers. In the lower left, we have the thinkers. They're detail oriented leaders and focused on what it takes to get the job done right. Thinkers are also task oriented, like the director, but they assume that there's truly a best way to do things. It's their job to make sure no mistakes are made. They frame the world as a place to solve problems and to get things done. And then as you can imagine, kind of looking at the lower right with counselor and nurturer and pleaser and, and provider, those are the harmonizers. The harmonizers lead by supporting the team. They're very, simi they're very similar to expressors, but harmonizers, they're also very people-oriented. They they think they need to look after the needs of the team and other people's welfare. They often see the world as a place where personal relationships are an extremely important part of their lives, and they prefer really heavy collaboration. And if you want to jump to the next slide, so we talk about communication styles. And, you know, you, you really have to get into quickly which which 
basic style each one of these have, right? So as we said, you adapt to your audience. We broke it down into three levels. So if you think about your, your pace of your speech, when you're talking to a director or an expressor, you're quick, you're sticking and moving. When you're talking to a director or expressor that lives in the Northeast, you're at a lightning pace, uh, and, it, and it's just the way it works. Uh, from a detail standpoint, obviously, sometimes they prefer 10,000, 50,000 foot views, a little bit easier, and they can drill into to, to questions. And generally, the questions that you're going to ask them are close-ended. Um, when you kind of start to, to slide over, now your pace starts to slow up a little bit. And now, as we mentioned, the detail gets a little bit more um, Im important to them. And what type of detail you present becomes more important. And the types of questions you ask uh, are, are, are going to change. As you see with a thinker, you're going to have some closed-ended and so, some open-ended. You want to drive the conversation. And it's easy to do it with, with a thinker, but we're going to talk a little bit later about there's a balance of that quantitative aspect of your conversation versus just the qualitative. Where the harmonizer, the harmonizer, as you would imagine, very much on, on, on the qualitative. And we can jump to the next one, Ann. Can I ask you a quick question just so that people understand, Marco? Like, what would be an example of a closed-ended question versus an open-ended question? Yeah, so, so a, a close-ended question generally, to, to be real simple, yes or no. Um, and, and, it's, and it's more of a, a stick-and-move motion where an open-ended question is you're literally asking for their opinions and their ideas, and they're going to be uh, much more lengthy uh, in, 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 their, in their responses back. And quite frankly, for those people that have the time that are going to run a little bit slower, you'll, you'll glean a lot from the information that comes at you, so you can then continue to cater your pitch towards that person sitting across from you? Great question, Ann. So we talk about communication styles. Well, let's talk about some personality traits here. So an asserter is going to instantly give you a response and typically won't ask whether you agree or not. They're going to move through conversations quickly and they tend to dominate the room. As you would imagine, it's assertive, right? Um, it is interesting when, when, when you see the asserter, they tend to take risk um, a little bit more often than, than some of the others, especially when you get down into the, 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 the feelers. Uh, an inquirer is more of a probing leader. They're going to say what she thinks and then ask a genuine question. That's just my sense of it. What's your opinion? And they're going to solicit feedback from you, and there's a, literally a, a, a back and forth. The more uh, factual or the fact-oriented person is going to talk about studies, numbers, industry trends, statistics. They're going to speak in terms of what's right or wrong. And obviously, you know, it's more than just showing them statistics because generally those factual people, when you start showing statistics, you've got to back them up. They're going to dig in. They're going to go two or three questions deep. And we'll talk about that in, in just a little bit. And then a person who focuses on feelings will talk about the quality of the people that she works with or their ability to meet whatever challenges lie ahead. And as you can see on the chart, things will rest in terms of good or bad. So, you know, your job here is really simple once you figure out their communication style and the personality traits. You have to adapt. You can't be the bull when you're addressing another bull. Two bulls in the pen don't tend to work out that well. You also can't just lay over with a bull or you're going to get run over. Um, you also can't throw a lot of data at feelings-oriented people. You know, it's more about, as we mentioned, that qualitative aspect. So sometimes it, it's, it's more important to talk about the qualitative with, with the feeler than it is the quantitative. But it's really important when we talk about these concepts, personality traits and communication styles, not anyone lives in, in one box. So how do, you, how do you assess that and how, how do you deal with it? Uh, on the next slide, we developed a little bit of a, a, a cheat sheet for you. So you can say here what, what we looked at. So I, I happen to know uh, the president that I'm going to speak at tomorrow, and I just started checking boxes, right? So uh, they are very opinionated. Uh, their speech is incredibly fast moving. It's a, it's a stick and move type of conversation. Uh, they're very open to risk. Uh, they do like the data, so analytical. So the quantitative there is, is there. They're very inviting. They'll engage you in, into the conversations, make you feel comfortable to disclose even more sometimes too much if you're trying to do the show up and throw up methodology. Uh, and, and, and like we said, the, their, their speech tends to work as things are, are good or bad. So what we did was we just counted the circles and we went from the left to the right. And you can, do, you can use this chart for any conversation that you're going into to understand that they're gonna be assertive in feeling. So then based on that, you're gonna change your communication style so some of the things that we just covered. Uh, so that, you know, we're going to be more closed-ended questions, but feel them out because as a feeler, they like open-ended questions and conversations. Uh, they, they, they like to move quick. So this one, I mean, is really uh, 
dichotomy of personalities working here, right? So you, you, you just really kind of feel them out and make sure that your, your pitch and your presentation is set up to the style that, that they're going to be able to, again, get that retention and engagement that, that we're after from our audience. And, and I think to, to the people that are on this call, if you're only used to presenting one way and you do, and I, I don't know if you cut the show up and throw up um, co comment that Marco made, which means that you just came in with every fact known to man and you're just going to give them every fact known to man. That's called show up and throw up in case you didn't know. Um, you're going, you're going to tell, like, there's going to people, there's people on that call that are on that call or on that meeting that are going to go, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm done. I've checked out whether I've physically leave the room or I mentally left the room. Um, and it means that this means you have to learn how to pivot. So if you're not used to pivoting, this is called changing and changing your comfort level, if you will. And Next thing, yes. Sorry, we have a question before we go too, far, too much further into that. Uh, Angela is inquiring, what do you do if you have multiple personalities in one meeting? That's a fantastic question. It's going to happen almost all the time. Uh, you mean the so it, it, it really depends on, on, on what you're pitching. So what, what you want to do is try to be as much a Switzerland as you can possibly be. You can, you can live in a lot of different boxes and, and do it without encroaching. Uh, traditionally, what you want to do is, is kind of look around the room. There's generally one person in that room, and he or she can say no when everyone else says yes or yes when everyone else says no. That's your primary go-to, and then it kind of falls back. You know, it, 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 it's interesting. I've worked for a lot of Japanese companies, and in Japan, the way you sit across that conference table is important. It goes by rank from the door down from, from our, our company and then and whoever joins. So it gets really easy because you kind of start talking to the right and you work your way down the left. And then you're, but your communication style adapts to the points that are, that are um, more important or more relative to a particular stakeholder. So, so generally, when you're, when you're making a pitch, if there's one stakeholder, it's really easy. When there's a room full of them, there's, there's probably different owners of different sections. So you're going to change your style as you kind of work your way down that table. It's a great question, Angela. It really is. And I think you also, it, when we get further on in this conversation, you'll understand that it's not just, you know, a single, a, 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 a single facet to your presentation. You have to be able to know your data. You have to be able to know where you have to pivot and where you have to change. And, and a question shows up like, you know, like, so here we are ready to talk and Angela asks a question. You have to be prepared that someone's going to ask you a question in the middle of your conversation. So it's kind of the same, the same thing as you have to know your stuff and it's not just what's on the slides, right? So, yeah, I think a good, a good, a good tip or, or a trick there, Angela, is, you know, when, when you have a lot of data to present, but the, the main person you're presenting to is not a data person, not that many bullets on the slide. That's when you go with, with, with some handouts. So while, while, while the data people, the heavy quantitative people are digging into your handout to go through the data, the person that you really want to persuade is following you. Um, and that works both, both, both ways. So there's a, there's a lot of kind of tips and, and, and tricks you can do. But um, Leanne, I, I, I agree with you. The person that can say yes when everyone else says no and no when everyone says yes, uh, they are the decider. Uh, so here, you know, when we talk about decider, you know, who is most important? Um, this is, uh, it, it's simple, but it's something that's plain essential. We were joking earlier as we kind of got, got on the call. My, my 15 year old has, has picked up on this uh, from a very early age. Whenever he's talking to anybody, he always rephrases what he's talking about to the what's in it for them. Um, so this was in, in, innate for him, and that's important. To, you know, for you to minimize the probability of success of your presentation, it, it's essential to know your audience as much as possible. But then focus on them. Words matter. Make sure they understand it's all about them, and it helps to increase their attention and engagement when we're talking about them. And ultimately, it helps you to persuade them towards your requested actions, ideas, or concepts. So what's in it for them is really simple to remember, but it's very important. And too often, we forget about that. Um, so it, again, when you, when you know your audience, you know like their, their goals and objectives and, and what, what they're trying to do within this fiscal year, you want to make sure that you're tying that into it because that'll, that'll keep their attention and keep them moving. And then value. So value is at the top of the charts in terms of what you want to convey to your audience. 
when we talk about the what's in it for them, we're really trying to convey the value of your ideas or your concepts. But keep in mind that value is simply the worth of something in the eye of your audience. You don't decide the value, they do. That's the key and very important. You don't decide on the value of your ideas. The audience does that for you every single time. So let's talk about some practical examples. I stole a, a, another cheat sheet years and years ago. Can't even remember where, where I got it, but I've been running around with it for a long time on the next slide, Ann. Oh, sorry. So there are chief sources of value. And so this was one of those slides that, uh, that Ann and I did at this, this presentation in Princeton. We talked about a value proposition. So these are, you know, when I say words matter, uh, it's funny. With, with some people, um, we, we think about maybe we want to pitch an idea that, that may decrease cost. And that's good. There's, there, there's value there. But you have to think about it because decreasing cost is finite. You can, you can get cost down to zero, but if you can increase revenue or profit or market share or morale, that then becomes limitless. So when you're thinking about the sources of value to choose, some are going to be more persuasive than others. So again, like I said, I, I, I use this cheat sheet a lot. Uh, I show it to a lot of my people because as we're going through a lot of these conversations, sometimes they forget about the what's in it for them and what would be the most resonating source of value for them. So I, I, I love this cheat sheet, use it a lot. Okay. So, and, and I think that it's really important that you recognize that there's more than one source of value. Sometimes people are very blinded, right? They, they just come in looking for, well, we're gonna increase productivity. Well, then there's a productivity, then maybe we're losing people, or maybe we're like, where, where are we putting that increased productivity? Where, what are we doing with the time that they're not doing something else? So like, so you're going to have all these other questions that come out as a result of, of you putting in a value. Like, what, what, what's, what's the outcome when I increase or decrease something else? That analytical person is going to start asking, well, wh well what are we going to do with, th with this? Or what are we doing with that money? Or like, you have to be ready for that next question, right? Because what's important to you is going to have a trigger a different set of questions to a different, to a different thinker. When, when you're thinking about some of the things that are on this list, it's important that when you're talking about statistics like these, these lists that Marco gave us, is that you have things that, that you can lead with. It's not just you. You know, I can come into a meeting and talk about things based on experience, as can Marco, but, and many of you on this call. Right. But you it's not just how important you are in this world and what experience you have. You need to come in with statistics that support that, whether that's, you know, AIM or ARMA or, or IAPP or ILTA, or Gartner, Forster, the Bar Association, American Bar Association, your industry, whether it's, you know, something that's in pharma, something that's in government, something that's in 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 engineering. You know, you there will be statistics that can come from any one of these organizations that proves to things that happen in that particular industry. Use them, right? I if you look at most any um, presentation I give, I do a lot of pictures with stats because that says not I'm only going to talk about it, but here other leaders in the industry say this is what's going on. This is this is tried and true. And I and if you don't have that kind of stuff and when you do that, by the way, you do need to cite, you know, what you're saying. You can't just say, oh, so-and-so said this. You need to show the date, the time, you know, where you got it from, what's the source, and what year it's pertinent to, or it will not be of much impact. But I, I think that when you're doing that, go look for some of these stats. You've gotten them from attending other programs. Ask some of your colleagues if you have access to some Gartner, if your company signed up for Gartner or signed up for, you know, Forrester. If you're in a large organization, they, they have that. Your marketing department has that most likely. So go back and find where that is. Um, the Some other things that are important are understanding how do I get to a perfect pitch moment? How do I, how do I get that to work? What are some strategies? And I think the very first thing is just understanding what your team's culture is about. Like how, whether it's your team or and in my case, I usually have to go in and understand what's my client's culture about. I'm like today I was on a call and I'm like, well, does, does the team that's coming to a meeting with, do they, do they like emails? Do they like to talk? Do they like meetings? Do like, how do they like to communicate? So I need to know the leadership at the top. Will they respond to my email? Will they show up at a meeting? Like, I, do they like a two bullet email and that's it? Like, don't tell them the reasons or are they the person that wants the whole explanation with the attachments? So you do need to understand what your team's culture is about when you're preparing this pitch. Are they going to be looking at you with their arms crossed, their eyes crossed, every, you know, are they, are they re 
do they reject what it is that, that what there's change involved or do they embrace change like you, you need to you need to do a little research behind that then the next thing is is that and it's something we don't do it's the reason i'm in business all day long it's I could just call this business development, I mean, business requirements, develop, define, refine the proposed process. You need to understand what it is that the person or the organization or the practice area or the department head is looking to change. And you, you will find that often what they said they want and what you end up with are at completely different ends of the spectrum by the time you do the business requirements. Because if you've involved everybody in the process, which all of us that are in information governance know, you have to involve every aspect of the party, um, invite them all to the party, then you're gonna come up with a different outcome. So that's something that I call is in jello, not in concrete yet, right? So you, it's gonna change as you start learning a little bit more about what's going on. And you've, you've figured out from the person whose arms are crossed in the back of the room, or on, on the side that just keeps putting themselves on mute and taking themselves off the pictures, that there's a reason why they're doing it. It's because somebody didn't listen to them before. But if you've listened to them and said, hey, I'm hearing you, let me let me listen. Um, you'll, you'll find out what it, why things didn't work before and what, why they're not participating and maybe you can improve that. Another thing is when you're doing an IG program or an information management program or a record, whatever program you are, you need to find somebody in management who gets what's going on and that can be your ally and i when i say not just a supporter an ally they're the person an ally is different than a supporter an ally is someone that even when they talk about it at a management meeting and you're not there to support your project they're supporting your project for you right marco isn't that the big difference on a, an ally versus there, a supporter? There, yeah there, there is and I, I can't say you know how to, to build that grassroots efforts and sometimes it's really a blend of, of, of supporters and allies but to have have that ally beside you is paramount um, and it also when you're when you're pitching your, your IG strategy again when you have that grassroots movement or that that, that that groundswell up type of type of movement it's really easy for an executive to see uh, not only the criticality of that but the ease of execution because you've got other stakeholders bought in. Right. That's and, I, a great point. Yeah. and I think the ally part is, you know, you can have lots of management team members supporting you, but that person that's going to say, no, 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 I, I really want you to like, it's going to be that person that puts the stake, you know, the stake in the ground along with you, right? They're, they're, that's the ally. The, uh, another thing is having the ability, you have to be able to evangelize. And, and my kids would say, stop using that word. Like, um, you're not, you know, you're not, you're, you're the church lady already. Do you need to be the church lady, you know, again, in business? Um, um, <laughs> you need to, you need to take every moment and every opportunity you have to evangelize your product and your project and your task, whatever that is, and get people to come on to that, you know, that project team with you. Uh, explaining like when you're, you know, you're, you're just, whenever the conversation comes up, it shouldn't be like you're, that's all you talk about. But when you have that opportunity to say, hey, did you hear about this? Or this is what that, this is what that new software is going to do for us. Or this is what this, like, you should have the ability to talk about why there's a benefit for them to join your information governance strategy project. And, and when you do that, it's always going to be something that it doesn't have to be, it should actually be not long at all. It should be something that is like, oh, yeah, did you hear this is what, well, that's what this new process is going to do. Let me tell you a little bit about that. And it should not be a, a, a dissertation. It should just be something quite simple. Then the other thing that many of you, <laughs> I say this, not many people went to school in information governance to be marketing and sales teams. But once you're in information governance and information management, you are actually on a sales team. You just didn't know it. Like you are... You're selling information management, information governance, inf records management. You're selling that project to your internal constituents and they and they need to buy in. And, and that means you're going to be doing a lot of marketing. You're going to be doing a lot of selling and, and it's soft sell. It's not like hit them over the head. You know, it's not like the those, you know, those videos that you see on Facebook and the the and you know the info the infomercials you see on tv it's not that no one wants to hear that but it's the soft sell it's the just always being present always being kind always being around always explaining how this will help let let me let me show you let me let me explain to you why this is going to be helpful and 
and you have to end up being an evangelizer, right? Take off that, you know, those, they go kind of hand in hand. Some other things that help is practicing. You know, we, we talked about in the beginning that, you know, you think it's really easy that Marco and I do this all the time. I mean, I've done this before. You can probably, I talk all the time. I, you know, we were just talking about it the other day on a, on a project of, I, I was one of those people that made everybody else have to write, I will not talk or I will be quiet in school because I didn't stop talking, but, um, but, but it's still, I still talk, but it's very easy for me to capture the, the verbal word and, and, and put thoughts together. That may not be easy for you. That may not be easy for you. So if that's not, if you know that you're not good at that, then it requires that you get ready to have an elevator pitch in your head. You know how they say, oh, you need an elevator pitch to say about you. If somebody says, oh, tell me what it is you do, right? If you get on a Zoom call and they say, introduce yourself, you better not be taking five minutes to introduce yourself. So the same thing is with an elevator pitch about a project, tell them why you want them to be involved in your new records management project. Tell them why you want them involved in the new security thing. You need to come up with that real quick, succinct answer about why it's important and have some different answers based on going back to Marco's point of who it is you're talking to. Are you talking to the touchy feely person that wants everybody to feel like they're all part of the same? Or you're, you're talking to the person that wants a, a five second, don't tell me more than five seconds, right? So you need to have a couple of pitches ready and you need to practice that pitch. And if you're not sure if you can do that pitch correctly, I don't know if those of you know that, but there's a new feature in in PowerPoint. I don't know if you if you know this, put a couple of bullet points in, um, up on a slide, there's a PowerPoint um, rehearsal coach now. It's just a new feature that was put out in the past month that you can you can record your your you can record your uh, pitch, and and it will tell you when you're saying and um or I you know like you're saying too many throwaway words and it'll say and it, it'll it'll annoy you. It'll be over in the corner. It'll say you're saying and um too much. Perhaps you not do like you know it's kind of like that little. I don't know, uh, uh, Flippy, remember, was it Clippy, Clippy, the Clippy, the guy that used to give us all the little things about how to how to fix things in our documents. But it's the same kind of let me tell you this. So if you're not good at that, um, that's that's kind of a cool thing. Even if you're giving a presentation, that's a that's a new thing that's out in um, in Microsoft World. Um, knowing your audience goes back to all the slides that 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 Marco talked about, knowing who your audience is, what kind of information they like, how they like that information delivered, and identifying that value. What's in it for them? Not what's in it for me. Why do I think it's the coolest thing since sliced bread? I know I'm all about records management. I need these things. You need to explain to them why records management or why changing the information governance or putting security policies in place or what, what's in it for them to join your journey not it needs to be done nobody nobody wants to hear it needs to be done nobody wants something just done um just think about your kids saying just do it because i said so nobody likes hearing because i said so come up with a different way you're still saying because i said so you're just saying it a different way um and to your point about knowing your audience michael's points out that uh, they've had better success using animations to promote their program with staff rather than the usual memo or news article um, so the audience is more receptive to that than they would be to something textual. Mm -hmm. We are um, uh, one of my clients. Uh, they just bought um, No Before for security awareness, and I don't particularly love all of their little uh, security awareness training things. So we've done particular things that talk about videos, little snippy videos. You know, here's a five minute video. Here, this is something that just happened. This is what you need to know, and they'll they'll do that rather than come to a training. Right. So because they'll they like to hear they like to hear you talk or they like. But as long as it's short and sweet, nobody wants to hear come to a, an hour long training session, an hour long thing. So if you can do it, make it funny, make it you know interesting, something that's different, because in this world where we are all sitting in front of a screen, we're all kind of screened out. Right. We're all like done. Nobody wants to be hearing more information like how many more things can you go to. Right. Um, one of the things that you will find that's very helpful when you're working with a new project and you're, you've got, you know, you've got it down to a couple of vendors uh, and, and Marco can attest to this, that, that, that the vendor partner will have, they do this all day long. Like this is a new journey for you, but you know, Marco and I 
do this kind of stuff all day long. Let, let me give, let us give you a few slides from our bajillion slide decks that we have on these bajillion things that we've done. Oh, you do this? Let's give you that. Oh, our marketing. No, I'm, I'm, I'm solo, but Marco comes from a very, very large corporation. So they have all kinds of stats and things that they've had to do to win projects. So when you were working with a larger vendor or, or, or any size vendor, partner, whatever you want to call them, they, they have stuff that they've put together so that their sales teams will win the deal. Use those things. That's they, they're more than happy. So don't go reinventing the wheel and making life hard for yourself because they'll have those stats available to you. Um, you have many, many, many relationships, and I encourage you to continue developing those relationships, but other people have put maybe something in place like you have. Use these networking opportunities, like what we're going to be doing afterwards, to develop relationships with other people to say, hey, I heard you were doing something like this. What did you do? How did you do it? How, how would you suggest I approach this? Use the relationships that you've built with other people to help you say, hey, I, I met with so-and-so of such and such a place, and they did X, Y, Z. So it's not, you, you know, you've, you've talked to other people either in your industry or within our sub-industries that can say they've they've had this experience and why they've had that experience. It doesn't mean it's going to be the same as yours, but there's another source of information. And the last one is when when it's time for that show and tell, make sure, kind of to Jackie's point that she raised, is that make sure that there's a visual impact. Because again, we are, m most of us are visual learners. You know, some people are auditory learners, some people are touch. I'm, I'm, and I'm all three of those things, right? There's five mm -hmm. ways to learn. Um, it depends on how people are, but almost everyone is a visual learner. Almost every well, single person is a visual learner. Interesting. Uh, Leanne says she uses comic books. Oh, okay. Which I, I, I'd love to hear more about afterwards. So maybe during the network session, Leanne will tell us a bit about it. Yeah, because I think using, I think using humor. I use a lot of quotes. I, I don't know if when you go back and you look at, um, you know, where what when I we put the slides together, I use quotes a lot. Some of them are funny. Some of them are very poignant, but I use quotes a lot to make people think about what, what, are, what are you doing? Um, and, and, and that, those are impactful, right? You, you start thinking, oh, that, that, that really applies to me here, right? Um, I use Marco's quote all the time. What, what's the one that you use the, the quickest way to, you use since, uh, what's the one that you use? I'll go back to your slide, but it's the strategy versus tactics. Um, oh, so <laughs> Sun Tzu, God, there's so many. Oh, I I it's on your, it's on your thing. Wall. I have it on your thing. It's a uh, strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. Tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. So, I mean, you know, I have, so, I, I quote my grandmother, do the right thing. You know, it's so much easier to be kind um, than it is to be mean. So just be nice. It doesn't cost you anything, right? That was my grandmother talking to me. So, um, but those, those are things that, you know, what, what can you use? These are just some, some, these are some slides that I've used somewhere else, right? These are slides where I've incorporated something from, from ILTA, right? That, you know, I took, we were, they were trying to, we had partners that didn't want to spend any money. <laughs> well, we, I don't know why we have to, we're not, we don't need to spend that kind of money. Well, no, we showed that when we took our budget and, and, and pulled that together, that, our team was, uh, by the time you took the budget and you divided it by the attorneys, it was about 10K per attorney. And if I looked at what the rest of the world was doing, we were smack dab in the middle. So it wasn't like we were being, you know, crazy people, but but it, it was a chart that I could go back and take statistics that said, here's what these people are doing. And this is what the rest of the industry is doing in your market. So it, it gave a, a level set, if you will. Um, the, and Jonathan Deming has a great quote that without statistics or data, are you just another person with an opinion? Oh, that's a great one. That's a great one. He, did he put it in the quote? Did he put it in the chat? <laughs> no, no, Jonathan Demi is a, a business manager consultant. Oh, well, that's a great one. You should put it in the yeah. quote. Yeah, in Japanese business, and industrial engineering, time and motion yep. studies. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So another one is, and, and you can get in trouble here, so be, pre be prepared. Um, Marco and I have been in plenty of these. I, I, they, everybody wants this uh, TCO, um, total cost of ownership. That's what TCO stands for, and ROI, return on investment. And somebody, that, that personality that was, I want the money and the statistics and the analytics, that analytic person wants this stuff, right, Marco? They, they want mm -hmm. this stuff. And so you spend all this time, and again, 
if you're working with a vendor, they usually have these spreadsheets that will help you figure that out. And you just plug in the money and then they'll tell you what this is, right? They'll, they'll come up with a number, but it's uh, cost savings or TCO models or you know, like all of these people can help you figure out, is it hard cost versus soft cost? So a hard cost is, hey, I'm buying X number of computers and I'm buying, you know, replacing X number of screens or replacing X. Those are hard, you know, that's physical assets. And soft costs are things like, I'm saving time on people doing this activity or, you know, those soft costs are usually people related. I'm saving, I'm saving time that you, you, they're not hard and fast rules because you can't truly, truly measure them all the time every day, right? You, you're kind of assuming costs. Um, yeah. And, and if, if you go back to some of the things we're talking about, the personality styles, as you can imagine, the assertive people might be more about the hard costs and might not care about the soft costs where the feelers uh, sometimes their soft costs are really important to them. And this is one thing I'll, I'll tell you, and it doesn't always apply and you'll, you'll be surprised, but this is one of those things that you can reach out to the stakeholder that you're presenting to or stakeholders and ask them as we put together uh, some, some cost analysis for you, do, would, you know, do you consider, do you want to see the soft costs? Would you consider the soft costs or hard costs? But understanding that is great because I've seen people put together the greatest uh, statistical analysis or, or, or this cost data and like pop on a balloon in the middle of a presentation when they go, no, 70% of what you listed, that doesn't really apply to us. We don't really care about that or I don't care about that. Um, so you can, you can get ahead and quite frankly, it shows them that you're preparing for it and it allows you to make a, a much more impactful point with the numbers that they, they want to. Yeah, but I think you can also get in trouble, as Marco said. So you have to be ready to pivot when, you know, you have to be ready to pivot to when they say, no, we don't care. Who who made the assumption that we're going to save that much time? Do you have statistics? Like, so that person that can be that statistical analytical person can also be your arch enemy in a meeting like this when you thought you were really well prepared, because they might just have had a bad day and decided your numbers don't look right, right? Like you, you soft costs are really hard to Soft costs are really hard to pull together. Um, but again, you're the vendor that's involved with helping you deliver that project. Somebody has put the, has time. I mean, Marco, right? Doesn't your team have like you, you, you have so many analyses that they just say, oh, this is one that we used for so and so. And then they literally, how many people do you have? What are you, how many things are you delivering? What do you, and it just kind of like all trickles down. So you do not need to be doing all of this. Um, this was a uh, again. This was one. I, I this one I used, and it's done. It's done very well. But I was in a meeting where they're like, "Well, who decided six, twelve, and twelve? Like, who who decided those were the numbers?" I'm like, "I, I just said if in a, if if in this world, you know, uh, taking the smallest thing. This was uh, searching. Like people couldn't find their emails, and they were going to a new document management system, and they couldn't find stuff. They were couldn't find their documents. They couldn't find. And so we just calculated." how many minutes a partner did, how many minutes associates did, how many minutes a paralegal did. And if you calculated it out at the lost amount of time that they were using times the number of days th throughout the year at, the, at their hourly rate, that's what the internal conservative savings was. If, if, the, if, the, if the management DMS program you were implementing was gonna be $200,000, well, okay, well, you just saved $624,000. So it sounds pretty good until somebody says, show me. <laughs> so you just have to be prepared that it might not fly. Um, so the other thing is, uh, I hate to scare people to death. I, I, some people like to scare, like on a, I, I'm doing a security presentation tomorrow and some people like to come in and scare the bejesus out of you. And we all should be scared about what goes on in, in cybersecurity and risk and privacy and the things that can just, you know, shoot, sh take the feet out from underneath you. So you can illustrate risk. And I think there's better ways to illustrate risk than, oh my God, the sky's falling. I, I really think that, uh, but you do need to illustrate risk. And I, I really think that the thing that you point out is using my favorite phrase of you really don't know what you really don't know. And identifying that there's all, you know, they sometimes people come in with preconceived notions about what they think the, the solution to a problem is. And when you start identifying and showing them and educating them, they start realizing that the universe is way bigger than the, than the little planet they were living on. And, and that's where this, you really don't know where you really don't know comes into play. Uh, I do a lot of educational things, particularly when it comes into cybersecurity. We, I just 
I just do a plain, here, here's what cybersecurity is about. And when they start talking about, oh my God, I didn't know what these statistics were, all of a sudden, the, I don't need to tell them that they didn't know that. All of a sudden, they realize they didn't know that. And you can see this, the, the, you can see the scared faces. And I don't have to say you ought to be scared because there's smart people that are in that room. Um, uh, what I like to do is I, I like to make sure that we're eliminating reputational risk, right? You didn't buy cyber insurance. You didn't you you didn't put the lock on the door. You didn't like simple things that can cause you to be above the fold of the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the American, you know, the, the whatever that above the fold is. You don't want to be on that, you know, ticker tape that's running across, you know, the stock exchange. Um, I, I don't want to be that. So we want to make sure that we're not the people that didn't have redaction software in and 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 they're now being sued because they didn't redact personal identifiable information, right? So we want to make sure, and, and you can do that by showing what other people's mistakes have been and how do you get ahead of that. Um, the, the tech equipment, and when we're looking at what, what do we have in comparison to what we should have, and what are the standards that the rest of the world is living by, when you talk and do a comparative analysis between what we have and what we should have, and what the world, rest of the world is doing, that's a pretty easy, that's a pretty easy lift. Um, and then when we talk about what, what are some of the risk statistics that other industry leaders are, are telling us we need to be doing, again, you can go compile information that you get from other organizations. Like it's not from me getting it from the law firm down the street or me asking it from Marco and his team. I go out and grab real statistics that have been published by, you know, research organizations. So like, when I would, um, I would be talking, and I, um, for those of you that are, and there's plenty of resources, but I, I use a lot from, um, uh, this is from Baker Hotstetler, and, and that's a report, but this is from the um, OCR, the um, Office of, uh, I can't even think of what it is, it's the um, Office of Civil Rights, right? And this was HIPAA, HIPAA re regulation. So this involved who who had HIPAA breaches for, from the Office of Civil Rights. But um, oh. Baker Hotstetler has a, uh, I use a lot of their stuff when they're talking about um, incident response and, and they have a data incident response report, which you can get from their, from their, from their website. And so you can grab any one of those because they're really, really easy to use graphics. So what you want is you don't want to really, you want a very clean chart. You want something that's very easy to read, very to the point, very, you know, to you know, like to what Jackie brought up. Animated doesn't necessarily need to be animated, but it has to be visual where it's easy to easy to read. This is where the Office of um, Civil Rights penalized people for having breached information, right? So where do I fit in here? So it's gonna gonna keep increasing when we get all the 2020 data into into this. It's just gonna keep going. And so if they process that, then they're going to be going, Ooh, we do that. Maybe we ought to be paying attention here. Marco, you were going to say something? Yeah. Oh, I do. You know, when, when you talk about risk and introduce risk, so there are, there are a couple of schools of thoughts, right? So the FUD, uh, fear, uncertainty, and doubt uh, was that thing. When, when, when you, when you introduce concepts that are a little scary, that's why I love doing security presentations because I like scaring the crap out of everybody. But when you introduce that fear and uncertainty and doubt, the whole point is to make them sick so you can make them better. Right. And, and what I'll challenge you is, you know, for the for, for the risk information, some people like to leave that out. Right. Because maybe it's not the most positive of connotations. But when you're when you're what you're pitching is too much roses and buttercups, it's not really believable. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't seem like it's, it's, it's executable. So getting getting to that first and, and in introducing risk ahead of time and being able to, to deal with that or any objections that come out of that are paramount to be able to get your, your, your point across. So I think these are these are great examples. Um, here, here was another uh, a slide that I've used. Again, it goes back to that. Um, it goes back to the analytic person that they, when you go in front of an executive committee um, or a partnership committee or a CEO level t suite, uh, you might want to do what, what? What did you call that, Marco? Uh, show up, throw up, right? Show up, throw up. Like you, you want to, you want them to see all the slides you pulled together to give into all the different things, and and really they want to see four slides. They want to know the risk. They want to know the name of the project. They want to know the success story, and they want to know how much it's going to cost them. And or they may have told you you get an hour to speak to us, and now some other crisis has come up, and you get you get fifteen minutes. You better know how to pivot, and how to make your you know thirty slides or twenty slides or fifteen slides go to 
to two or three. And so I had all this data and I had some very uh, impatient executive committee people. They were so impatient. I, I couldn't even keep them in a room. Like it was ridiculous. I'd be like, okay, I, 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 I couldn't, there was, it was the most ridiculous thing. But anyway, all they really wanted to know was how much is it going to cost me to lay out of the partnership funds? And how much do I have to, how much do I have to do going forward? Really, that, that was, I could have just come and done the whole thing this way because when it came down to it, they, they agreed that their people were smart enough to have uh, agreed on the, on what they, what they wanted, but they just wanted to know how much was it going to cost me? How much do I have to lay out? Okay, why am I laying it out? And then I didn't have to, I didn't have to do anything more than that. That's all they wanted to know. Just get to that slide, would you? Okay, that's, that's the slide we got to. And that talks to the personality types that were in the room who were very dictator kind of director. I only want to know this. And, and so again, you have to know who you're dealing with and what kind of information they need to, um, to ingest to make decisions. And, and, and somebody else might want way more than somebody else might have wanted to see what's the maintenance agreement includes what's, you know, what, what's the software maintenance include, like all the, you have to have all that supporting detail. You have to know, cause somebody else might want to see, well, did we get a discount on that? What's the thing? Are we getting 18 months? Are we doing like, you know, they might want to know all the agreement levels beyond that. Um, but you know, what's our failover? What, you know, what's our risk with the failover? Like each one of these had mounds and mounds of data to go with it. But, and I, I had to be able to address all of those, but at the end of it, all they wanted to know is, yep, we had all these things and yep, we had all those things and that's what it's going to cost me. And I knew what that audience wanted, uh, you know, but I had to do all that work and understand all that to get to that point, to make that one slide, because I couldn't have done it without knowing all that data. That was a lot of work. That meant meeting with every single one of those different vendors, knowing what the contract involved, knowing what was the underlying you know, agreements underneath that, and where were we going to get screwed if we didn't understand the meetings, and we were going to pay for that and not going to pay for this. So when you get to this, this looks like, oh, this is a very easy. Let me just put the numbers on the board. But you can't put the numbers on the board until you've done all the homework behind that. So, But it's a great, yeah, what, great way to present information. Right, Marco? It is. It is. I, she, Ann made, made a point, and I don't want to glance over because it's become a habit of mine over about the last decade or so, is that when I've been in to pitch ideas before, I would say that one out of every 15, hey, sorry, I know we had this scheduled for, for two hours. I have five minutes. What do you got? And you see people start to go through 60 slides in, two, you know, in five minutes, and it's just a disaster. So if you ever look at, at, at one of my presentation decks, after the end or thank you, there's one slide. And there's one slide that if I had to put all this onto one slide just to get my point out in five minutes or less, I'm ready for it. And I can't tell you how many times I have been saved by the fact that I created that one slide. Um, so it's one of those things when you talk about preparation, again, tip, tip, tip or trick, but just be ready to have your time condensed into half or into almost nothing and still get what you wanted. Um, but it's all down to the preparation, which I think feeds into Ann's next slide. Yeah, and I think the uh, and one more thing to add to that is if you work with PowerPoint a lot, there's a thing called sections and you can create a section and, you, and even if it's more than one slide, you can create a section and just collapse, you know, go out and just, you know, go out of your presentation slide and put those two or three slides in a section and it's at the end and you just go to the end, right, go to the end section or the close section. So um, almost every deck I do has uh, sections in it so that I can go right away to where I need to go. So um, this I thought was key. This is a, this is a Marco, a Marco slide. Good, good players practice until they get it right. Great players practice so they can't get it wrong. My, my kids, that has been so far drilled into them. Uh, this is, this is one of my favorites, but I think it gets down to, if you think about, there's been this theme of preparation and and how much that that will yield you can backtrack every slide in this presentation and it all kind of um, really circles around this this theme so again you can try to show up and throw up uh, i've got a lot of sales people to work for me that, that that have tried that concept they don't work in sales for very long anymore um, it's just not that type of, of of an environment anymore so it is really being completely prepared and what you'll find out is and it's funny that some people will test you and they'll take that one hour and make it into five minutes just to see if you can do it. Um, but there's no greater feeling than, than getting the answer yes in five minutes instead of having to draw on the death by PowerPoint for an hour. Uh, so this is something I mean, I cannot 
harping up at every slide that, that we went into, and this applies to all aspects of life, not, not only in perfecting your pitch, but uh, practice, practice, practice. It does make you perfect. So to, to wrap up, um, I, I, we wanted to give you just kind of a wrap up slide of how do we get there from here. And for those of you who know my other, one of my other dear friends, Richard Kessler, it's like, how do you, how do you get to yes? How do, how do you get to yes is basically the question. And so, you know, know the players in the culture. You have to know who you're dealing with, when you're dealing with them. Go back to Marco's list of all the different types of personalities and what, what goes on with them. Um, do your homework, right? All that supporting information. Know all, you really have to know. You have to be like the expert of all experts. Um, have your solutions and your stat slides. Know what the stats are. Um, this is a good one, Marco, right? Like, I think it's, it's, it, it's important to set expectations, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. Critical, absolutely critical. Take, take, take the guesswork out of the game. You know, they, they want to know if I buy now, what am I going to do? And, and, and a lot of times, like you'll have sales say they'll pressure you to, and the best, the best time to buy anything for a company, by the way, if you don't know this, if you're not been in the sales cycle is the fourth end of the fourth quarter when everybody's trying to get their sales for the year. But don't, I'm sorry, Marco, but don't, you're going to get your best price, your best deal, but you're not going to get your best implementation plan because nobody, all they're doing is trying to get everything into their pipeline. They'll get it closed, but you might not know. So be aware of when you're going to get your deal that you closed on implemented that, that you might be at the behest of the organization that you bought from. No. Yeah, so, another character just added to that one, and So, so not, not only the timelines, if there are compelling events, that are, and when I say compelling event, I mean something bad is going to happen if somebody doesn't do something, the person that you're sitting across from. But if there are compelling events, you want to make sure that you take advantage of that within your pitch because they, it tends to be a go or no go moment for, for, for them. So very, very, very important along with the implementation timelines. Absolutely. And make sure you have the required resources. Make sure that whatever you need to have happen, you have them, whether it's on the vendor side or whether it's on your internal side. Because if you need X number of people and they're not available to help you, it's going to be back to the purchase and timeline implementation. It's not going to go real well. Um, you know, the total cost of ownership and funding resources, make sure you understand when that monies are, those monies are going to be available and, and what's the impact going to be for you to get to that, that finish line. Um, understanding what the benefits are to the organization should they move forward with a project, understanding what it's going to be other for the return on their investment, where they can see process improvement inside of their organizations. Um, that's really, you know, what you're going to be focusing on. Setting expectations all the way around. And it's not just on the implementation, but, you know, if they thought they were going to get the, you know, the proverbial pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, and they really, they really weren't, it was they were getting like bronze, right? Um, you you need for them to understand what it is that they, you know, what they were going to get. Because sometimes we don't listen. There's a the adage that people only hear 30% of what you're speaking about at any given time. So if they heard the wrong 30%, you know, that's a problem. Or they, or, or they weren't listening at the other 70%. Um, make sure everybody understands what the expectations are. And, and I mean, we've all been, we've all been there. And then the last part is, and on a positive note, like, you know, yes, we can scare the bejesus out of them, like Marco likes to do with the, with the risk, um, that we, you know, find a nice way to end. You know, I, you know, we go back to my grandmother's, you know, just be nice. It costs you nothing, right? Even if you don't have two nickels to rub together, it costs you nothing to be nice. So um, end on a nice note because people, people don't, don't do well with confrontation. You know, even, even with that most confrontational person in the room, you got to find a way to be nice. You can't walk away being angry and, and, and not, uh, not positive. So with that, um, we're at, we're at the end of our, our, our time. It's two o'clock straight up, but um, are there any other questions, Jackie, that came in that, that we should be answering? No more questions in the chat, but I would like to open it up to the floor. So if anybody has a question that um, hasn't been addressed or anything at all for Anne or Marco, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask that question. So many of you, I'm having trouble seeing who's out there. <laughs> it doesn't look like anyone is on mute, man. So I think we address most of the questions during the course. So, so with this, we I I just want to do a, a, a pitch. Um, I, unless Jackie, you want to do what I just. No, Arm, feel free. Uh, you know, Arm in New Jersey, we do a lot of great things. We have a lot of great people in our in our organization. Um, and and 
and, and, and we're part of the Northeast region. So there we go, Mr. Bedner. Um, uh, we, we do a lot of great programming and, and we've been blessed to have a really great, when I said that in the beginning, that it's fun with friends. It is fun with friends here in New, in New Jersey. We've met a lot of wonderful people. Uh, Arma, New, Arma International is here. Our, we're part of the Northeast, like I said, which is, you know, our sister chapters nearby us are New England and uh, New, New York and Philadelphia. And, um, you know, those are our people up north, but there's plenty of people down south and uh, we, we enjoy working with with all of them. Um, so join us. This is our team. Uh, we're all volunteers. Uh, the, Many of them are on this call. Many of them have been involved across the board, but we enjoy, invite you if you have any questions to reach out to any of us uh, and, and we'd be happy to help you along the way. And um, we want to thank and you. And we did at the end get a question for you and Marco. Oh, okay, well, we'll yeah. How do you handle, it's from Leanne, how do you handle being a target of a hostile audience? A target at a hostile audience? Well, I'm going to pass it over to Mr. Marco. I love this one because Anna and I have spent a lot of time presenting to law firms and uh, and I've spent a lot of time presenting to lawyers specifically. And um, you almost have to make an example of somebody at the beginning or it turns into a pinata party and guess who's the pinata. Um, so there's there, 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 there are a couple ways to, to, to deal with it. You can do it with, with, with pure bravado. Um, I've had that work. I've had that not work before. Um, when it doesn't work, it goes bad really fast. Um, so I, I probably wouldn't recommend it unless you're extremely confident in that in that tack. Uh, but but traditionally diffusing the situation uh, and kind of calling a spade a spade, right? And say, hey, I, you know, I noticed someone's a little bit worked up. Uh, I'd like to make this as productive and constructive as we possibly can, right? And and then start kind of taking them down a, a better path or uncover why they're so hostile. Um, you know, for someone that's worked in outsourcing a long time, you know, I was sitting in front of a room and across from the board was a woman who was responsible for 240 people that were about to be outsourced at the end of my presentation. Trust me, that was hostile. Uh, I, I was at I was at um uh, I was at an oil and gas company where gunshot hit the window of the conference room we were in. So I've I've I've, I've played the hostile game before, um, and it gets really interesting. And I'll tell you, I think that's you know the the best way is really understanding the root of the hostility. And sometimes you have to stop the presentation and figure it out because they're not listening if you're just a target. Like I said, I mean if you're the other end of a, 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 a pinata a pinata party, it traditionally doesn't go well if you walk out of there with black eyes because they're not listening to anything you're saying. Um, I, and I often say, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, was there, was there something I missed in this? Is like, did I overstep a boundary? Did I, like, I, I try to take the more, I'm, you know, how can I, how can I make this better for you? Right. I'm, you know, I, I take a more, um, cause, cause everybody in the room knows they're being a jerk. Everybody in the room knows they're being a jerk. You're not, you're an outside party or you're, or, or, or you weren't, you know, you're here presenting, there shouldn't be a reason for you to become, uh, uh, like like Marco said, the pinata. Um, so, you know, how can I fix this? Well, if there's something that's wrong, let me get that information resolved and get it back to you. But if you, t if you, if you react in the same outburst tone, it's only going to escalate. So the whole key is to, you know, you do not need to respond immediately. My, my answer is usually take a deep breath count to 10, repeat the question that that person said in your head so that you are responding to that question, not to what you want to really say to them. Like in your head, you've got another set of words that you want to say to them, right? So, you know, and they're usually, you know, they're Ocean. Usually, it's, usually yeah. two. it's usually two, right? But, um, but you're not going to say that because you're a professional, but you, you, you want to de-escalate de that. You want to, you want to, you know, and, and you want that person to, A, not not be on your, you know, against team man. You want them to be on team man, right? So Angel says when he grows up, he wants to be like Ann. Oh, why thank you. Me too. Thank you. <laughs> I just try not to yell. I, I didn't yell at my kids, but that doesn't mean that, you, you know, they, they used to say uh, she's really nice until she's not. Right. And yeah. I, that doesn't mean that, um, that doesn't mean that I'm not going to, I don't have a temper. I just, usually it, it takes a lot to, to get that fuse to go. So, um, but are there any other questions, Jackie? Nope, not on the presentation. I want to thank you both. And this was fabulous. I mean, really enjoyed this. And just, you know, there's a lot to take away. For everyone on the call, don't go anywhere. We're not done. 
Um, you will, after the event, be sent a recording and the slide deck, so take advantage of it. And as Ann said, use those statistics any way you can use them. They'll help you make your case. And thank you very much. You're welcome. I'll stop sharing, and then, then we'll, I'll be back here. Um, That'd be great. If you want to turn I, I your... take. Well, I have, turn your cameras on, please, so we can see who you are, if you're interested. If you're not, don't worry about it. I'm also sitting here in jeans. Um, I'd like to introduce you all, however, to Chris Bednar. Chris is the president of the North or Northeast chapter, and uh, he's going to take the mic for a few minutes. Chris, it's all yours. <laughs> thanks, Jackie, and thanks, Anne, uh, and thanks, Marco, for doing this. Um, I sure. really don't want to you know, jump in uh, much here. I mean, you guys have done a great job. Uh, and even in pushing ARMA. Uh, so if you're not ARMA members, there's a lot to, there's a lot that we're doing here. There's a lot of programs. And I put a, a link to the Northeast region page uh, where we have a, a lot of upcoming other programs that you might be interested in as well. Um, one of the things I wanted to, I did want to point out before we start, actually this might even roll into the networking piece mm -hmm. um, is, um, is, the ability and and sometimes, yeah, you know, I, I find we we don't always take advantage of this, but learn from our business partners. So in in order to do something like this, we as you know myself as an internal corporate records manager, I'm I didn't go to sales marketing and marketing school. So for me to take a great idea that I hear at, at Legal Week or an Armour presentation, and I say, this, is, this would be great for me to use at Bain, um, I, I need those, those skills that you as you in the sort of vendor world uh, understand. And sort of, I think Anne and Marco, you were, you were both pointing this out today that um, you guys know how to do this and, and what it takes to uh, to win a contract with a company. We don't know how to do that necessarily internally. So I think th th these slides, this presentation was great for me to be able to take some of these great ideas that I hear and I say, oh, you know, um, yeah, I, I need this, you know, and, and well, how do I get from I need this to a presentation to my management? Uh, I think this is a way that yeah, we can learn from that. Well, and I think by just starting to incorporate a little bit of it, like it's really hard to incorporate everything you've ever learned, like in one time. So like maybe the next time you do it, go find some statistics to put in your slide deck, right? Or the next time, go find a funny cartoon to put into your slide deck or find like I use quotes on every, I, you'll, most of my decks that you, you can see, most of them have very few words on them. They have mostly pictures. They have mostly concepts. And, and you have to be comfortable enough to talk about the concept because you'll get more people to, to listen if you're not throwing, you know, uh, there's a, I want to call a 1030 rule, no more than, no smaller than 30 point size on your slide deck and no more than 10 words. So That's not a bad rule. You know, 1030 or 1030 rule. And I almost always never put, unless, unless it's a quote, there's never more than 10 words on a slide, right? There's, you know, it's mostly a graphic. Um, and I, I hate, you know, put some animation in that in the slide. But if you're not comfortable speaking, I'm telling you, go put your stuff on a slide deck up and use that um, PowerPoint slide coach. You know, it, 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 I, I, I'm going to put my friend's name in. She's so funny. I go find her. She uh, she has spoken with me. Um, I think uh, Nancy Merlin. And yeah. as you're looking for that, I'll share the, you know, the one benefit. So I definitely agree with Ann. Most of my presentations now are a few words and pictures. And there's multiple benefits of that. One, it keeps your audience awake. Uh, two, it keeps them engaged because they're not just reading your slides. But three, most importantly, I've had to pivot in a presentation a number of times. And, uh, you know, if there's just a picture there, it's kind of really easy to make a left turn and keep going on with, uh, with, a, with, a, with a new direction. Uh, so it, it really kind of works out in, in, in a lot of different ways. So I'm a very strong proponent of it as well. Yeah. You know, and there's the other thing, Marco, too, is just the slides up there. They're getting ahead of you and they're, they're formulating their questions in the background as you're, you're on point A and they're on yep. point D. So when you get there, you become that piñata. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So Nancy Merland is she's she's uh, she runs a marketing company and she's, you know, 
I met her through virtual networking and she did a, she does, she does a lot of uh, LinkedIn presentations and she did it. So look her up. It's too cute because she's the sweetest thing. Um, she's out of like Indianapolis. She's like a Midwest personality. Uh, and, and, <laughs> and she's got this, I'm going to teach you all about this, this presentation coach and she's recorded and she's, does this live presentation coach and she's like i did not say and um like i was not saying and um like it's <laughs> arguing back to that like and she's like okay well i didn't say that right so, and, and, and it was unnerving to her and here's a formal presenter she's like i wasn't saying that i don't know why it's thinking i'm saying that right so it's um, you know it's getting to her while she's doing this live presentation i was on the floor laughing but uh, you know what it does is it tells you whether you're you're saying it the right cadence you're using the wrong word are you reading your slide it tells you if you're reading your slides do not read your slides which is another reason why if you just put pictures up it's pretty hard to read your slide if you're putting pictures up right? exactly so um it's a really good tool to use if that's if that's something you're not comfortable with but the cadence if you're from the northeast we all talk like this so we're good. Well, you know, when we move at the speed of light, like Jackie, I saw that you told me in five minutes for five minutes till I already knew that we, we were on. Like, somebody tells me, and you have 30 seconds. I know what 30 seconds is. I know what an hour is. I kind of know. And I always set my timer on my clock, right? So when you're doing presentation mode, I, I set my timer. So I kind of know where I'm at and I'm looking at my clock. So I, you know, I'm aware of it. You weren't seeing me do this, right? I think once I picked up my, my phone just to make sure my I was on the right time. But those are things that the more you rehearse, the more you say, the more you are comfortable, the more comfortable you are with your data, because we're all data people, then somebody asks you a question, you should be able to answer it and not be having to worry about your slides because you know your data, right? You. Yeah. You should be able to not, you should be able to not have to rely. You should be able to, uh, um, one year at InfoGov, um, you know, Nick Inglis had, did, <laughs> had got, given us a session. I uh, actually gave, uh, it was this session, but it was a blend of this session and you had 20 minutes. And I got up to do my presentation and he had, somebody had had a death in the family and I got to do this presentation that this person hadn't started. And so I was doing it on the train, you know, Marco, we were just talking about doing presentations the day of, right? I was doing it on the train as I'm, you know, taking the train up to Hartford. And um, I got up there and thank God I had a paper copy. That's another thing. I had a paper copy of my presentation. The power went out in the room. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Well, then let me tell you about what I'm going to talk about. And and I was able to talk until they got everything together. I was able to talk. And when they plugged it in, I was right where I was supposed to be. Like they plugged it in. I moved to my slide and I was able to be right where I was supposed to be. And if I didn't, I wasn't comfortable with A, the topic I was talking about and B, where I was supposed to be in my slide deck, that would have, that would have crippled me. It would have just absolutely crippled me. And you know, I was I five, I was five minutes over, I think of my 20 minutes, but I, that not my fault, right? Like, you know, I, but I, I, but it, if you don't know what you're talking about, you better be prepared for the disaster. And the disaster is you might not have your PowerPoint or the yeah. disaster is, oh, by the way, we, we, we've got, we've got some board crisis and you only got one slide, right, Marco? You got, you got one slide and sorry to do this to you, but we got to usher you out right now. So um, yeah, that happens to me all the time. You know, and your stuff's yep. important. It's really important yep. stuff. It's not like it's not important stuff, but. You know. Yep. You know, Marco said something earlier about what's in it for them. What's in it for them is how you get everything done these days. You know, I, I worked for an organization last time around where the CFO basically told me, don't tell me about risk avoidance because I don't care. If something happens, I'll deal with it when it comes in. So you're not saving me anything. So I had to figure out how to reframe all of that. Most of our discussions in risk management is about reducing future costs, in risk management, about reducing future costs, future storage, future litigation. And he didn't care, wanted no, did no concern whatsoever. Tell me who's writing me a check today. And then you can talk about savings. So I had to learn to speak differently. So there was a question that was posed to me of, uh, can you, can you, Give me any tips on how to give a presentation in a New York minute, which I'm assuming is like you've, you, 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 you don't like it. Does, does I, I'm, I'm going to take it. There's two approaches. One is somebody's expecting hey, to tell them all about. Up. Yes, John. Uh, I did, oh. Yeah. I, I oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I sent you that message. Is it, uh, does the one slide presentation help in that qualify? 
Well, it, the, it, that helps. You might not, it, it might be a New York minute, but a New York minute might also mean, um, well, I didn't want to call you out. So I, I was, uh, I wasn't going to call you on that because you said that to me, I wasn't going to call you, but you called yourself out. Um, it could be, it could be, um, it could be that you only have the five minutes that could be your, you know, you only get one slide and that's your New York minute, but your New York minute might also be, Hey, Hey John, we need you to come in and talk to the team right, right now. And you don't have a slide. Right, Marco. Uh -huh. Right. Um, and in that case, you need to know your stuff. You need to know, yep. you need to know, you need to make that slide in your head if you don't have that slide already done mm -hmm. and be mm -hmm. ready to talk about what are the top, what are my top three points I wanna make, right? I, I've, I have, I, I've been called into a meeting and I, I need to make my top three points. And what will your top three points be, right? I've been known to write notes on my hand walking down the hallway. I <laughs> didn't like that. You know, you, 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 it's panic mode, right? I have to get in there. I have to talk now. And the board of directors is sitting waiting for me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I, yeah, I, I usually have sticky notes. Um, you know, I'll just put it on a real quick sticky note and I'll just put five things in. But I, I, I'm so used to somebody telling me I'm allowed to talk about something and I have five minutes. I, I'm, I usually drop down five bullet points and, and that's it, right? Um, yep. Well, and, my, my, experience, my experience was... Uh, for several years, I was a manager of a group of nine, and I had to give a, a quick presentation on how documents were handled when they arrived. I had I worked 11 years at Forest Laboratories when it was still existing, <laughs> and um, usually, usually sometimes there were um, clinical trial assistants who were coming in and needed to know the process, how the documents were processed. So I gave a 10-minute presentation as they were on a very tight timetable themselves. So um, in explaining how documents were channeled and eventually wound up in their appropriate place. And, and again, if you just to make it, if you have a chart, like if you, if you know you're gonna be, you know, you start compiling information, like I just keep slides and I know, oh, you know, I got a slide on this, or I got a slide on that. And I just keep all the things and I know to pull something from somewhere else. Oh, I did this for someone else, or I did this on another piece. Like, I got this from somewhere. Like, you know, I think Marco and I are probably our lives are are, are memorialized in PowerPoints, right? Um, but, you know, you, you need to start keeping notes of what if somebody asked you, because you know eventually you're going to be asked. So if you're working on a project right now that's underway, someone's going to ask you to, for you, or your boss is going to ask you to prepare for them what's the outcome so start start putting that deck together now even if it's not a deck even if it's an outline so that you're ready to talk like there's nothing worse than doing pulling an all-nighter to get it all written down and it's hard to transfer your information marco how do you do that oh so many different ways and the, i apologize i'm gonna run off track because i keep thinking about don't talk fast to sale it was this little message that was given to me about 30 some years ago um, because I see some people present and they get forced into that New York minute situation. Let's get to the verb. Um, so generally, like I said, whether the slides are or not, I'm ready to get to the verb. So I, it's, it's interesting when you see people do it and now all of a sudden the decision maker that you were trying to impress upon or get them to do something said, okay. And then you decide I'm going to go ahead and do the next 55 minutes of my presentation anyway, and you end up talking them out of it. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's one of those things that when you get, when you get what you came for, Hey guys, really good. 30 minutes back. See ya. Mic dropping out. Um, yeah. So, you know, I think when, especially when you get to that, that the New York minute moment, um, you know, you'll see there, there are more often times than not, the fact that you spent hours or days or weeks putting together a presentation. If you're, if you're in there to get a, to get an answer and you got your answer, you're, you're good. Um, you don't, don't feel compelled, ask them if they want to see the information, but a lot of times you don't have to, and I've seen it go awry so often. Uh, so it's one of those little tricks that, uh, I, I forgot to mention in the beginning, never talk past the sale. Um, um, sorry. And I just, I, I was ringing no, no, back no, in my mind. I, I had out. people that yesterday I was on a call and I could, I've not been able to get it. I've had like four or five projects up in the air and I've not been able to get the managing partner to, to sit with me. And so we had a. We had a crisis. It wasn't it wasn't the firm's crisis. It was another organization's crisis. They had a major breach, and one of major breaches sending you an email that you know you're impacted. 
I still have to tell the firm, right? I'm like, so I need, I need to know how you want to handle this because your data was breached. Like your, you, they, your client had a major breach. You are somehow impacted because they're sending you an email, right? So, um, so we talked about how he wanted to handle that, and we'd scheduled, I'd scheduled a half an hour. Wait, I'd scheduled a half an hour. We got through what he wanted. I already had everything outlined. We got through it in ten minutes. And I said, oh, good. You know what? I've got three other topics. Can I take the rest of that half hour? And we got through. Can I have this answer? Can I have that answer? Okay. What about this? Okay. We're doing this. Okay. That's good. Okay. I've got your blessing on that. So I made sure that I knew what other topics I might be able to slide in and, and he's still got five minutes back. So I knew, my, I knew what I needed to talk to him about and he was not answering me. So as long as I had him there, I needed to know what was in the pipeline. So again, if you know that it's hard to nail down a decision maker, you better know you know, like I knew that like when I got off this call, I've got a, a, a security audit crisis going on. And my answer was, well, how is that managing partner? How is that partner? He isn't a managing partner. How's that partner consume information? Oh, he's not even going to respond to you. Okay. Well, then I, I have my answer, right? So you just have to know the personalities involved and, and what's the what's the allotment of time they're going to give you to, to respond to that. But you have to be the expert. And it takes a lot of time. It's if you're not an extrovert and you're not good at speaking, you know, sign up for a course, sign up for any, there's so much free stuff right now. It's not always going to be free, but there's so much free stuff right now. If you know that public speaking is not your forte or there's a lot of it on LinkedIn, there's a lot of it on, you know, networking. There's a lot of stuff on how to, how to be better at this, take advantage of it. If you have the opportunity to, to take a public speaking course, do that. It's really hard right now. A lot of people aren't, you know, they're, they weren't social in the first place and now they're behind a screen and they're really not social. So my, my, that didn't stop for me. I mean, you'll never stop me talking, but um, <laughs> don't laugh, Marco. Um, I'm sorry. I'm tra- with you. I'll add you in. Yeah. <laughs> no, drink it really um, but, but the answer is, is that you need to know how to communicate and to communicate well, to communicate how to manage presentation styles, audience personalities, right. um, the virtual environment, virtual environment. I, I think there have been more opportunities and maybe Marco says no, but I think there've been more opportunities available to you in a virtual environment than there ever were in an in-person environment ever, ever. There yeah, Michael, talk to you. <clears throat> yeah, Michael, I mean, I, uh, I, the one idea that, that I would share that, that we've gotten more, and Ann and I didn't do a great job of it today, and it's, it's against the way we usually present, it's engaging your audience. So it's stopping with checking moments and it's, or polls on Zoom, or, but, but getting the audience engaged throughout has been so much easier virtually than it is in a conference room for some reason. Um, and it's been, been really, really interesting. Uh, but to your point, Ann, I, I'm on camera six, seven, eight hours a day, every single day now, um, get so much more done. I no, unfortunately I don't get to read email until six o'clock at night. Um, and my staff has gotten pretty acclimated with that, but, uh, it, it, it has really, um, changed the way you present. Um, it also lets you cheat a lot. I mean, as, as far as you guys know, I could have a teleprompter sitting right up here reading away, you know, um, so I've, I've seen a lot of people now, to Anne's point, though, know, know your material, because if the monitor dies in the middle of your presentation, you're a little screwed. Um, but, but I think it, it's, it, it's available a lot of different opportunities. And, and it's what is interesting, you know, especially for some of my staff, I have some people that are not extroverted. I, I, I don't think I'm an extrovert, but I'm a little crazy, so that maybe helps. Uh, but I think for, for, for the people who aren't truly extroverted or comfortable getting in front of room, like for me, it's easier to speak in front of an, an auditorium of 500 people than it is five. Um, that's, not, that's not normal. But for, for most people, to get in front of 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 people is a nightmare. But to get in front of the Brady Bunch box on Zoom, not that tough. Um, so what, it, what, what this has availed, I think, is it got a lot of people to practice at, at public speaking uh, and, and engage a bigger audience and realize that, you know what, it's not as terrifying as I thought it was. Um, so it's... It, it, it's definitely been interesting, Michael. And what do you think? Well, I, I think it's that. And I also think there's people that you have access to on Zoom that you would not have ever had access to, like that that would get on a call with you that they would never have gotten on a call with you and from a sales perspective um, before, right? They, they might, yep. you know, they, they, would, they would give you time that they maybe wouldn't have given you time before because they know they can't I, control that. 
I also find that if you're going to be doing it virtually, you have to think a little differently. I, I did a panel discussion last month um, for an audience in Europe, actually. And there were three of us on the panel, and we'd spent a month putting together the presentation. When we found out our faces would not be on the screen talking when you were looking at the slides, we opted not to run our deck and just to refer everybody to the deck, and then we talk to our topics. Because you're not going to engage them if they can't see you. Mm -hmm. You know, this way it was more of a conversation. And we found that we got a lot more participation, both in terms of questions on, online and, and vocally. Um, and people stayed connected to the presentation. Um, if they had been looking at slides throughout the whole thing, I think we would have lost many more people. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So I think it's just, it's a matter, it's, it has changed. And I think it's not going away. Right. Mm -hmm. Just like the hybrid world's not going away. Like who's going back to the office? We don't know. Right. So it, this is something that is a it's a, been a game changer um, and it's not going away. So you, yeah. you have to know how to you'd have to know how to present. You have to know how to use those tools and how to use them effectively. And 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 hopefully no one has to say you're on mute. We can't hear you. I, you know, um, you know we've all that's, that's what that that's when you play Zoom bingo. Well, there was this yeah. guy that, there's this guy that is on one of my things. He has a mug and, one, and, and it says, you're on mute. And when somebody's on mute, he lifts his mug up and everybody starts laughing because he's got this mug that says, you're on mute. I'm like, that is genius. We should all have you're on mute button buttons. So yeah. um, it's almost like you're a cat. I'm not a cat, your honor. Um, so I mean, it's, you know, it's it. the day that happened. I actually, I think it just had happened. It was like short of. The fact that the judge presented that, like to me, that's like so unethical. But um, but it was hilarious, and and I couldn't stop laughing. So you know, <laughs> having been so many, so many things, you know, like that have gone wrong, or you know, so th that's a whole other discussion. But um, Marco, right. thank you so much for being my friend, and for uh, and we thank you both for being with us. We have about two minutes left, and I see we have a number of folks who hung around from Mid Atlantic region. And I wondered if anybody wanted to share what's going on in your region real quick before we uh, lose everybody. So I don't know if anybody, Michael, Todd, Ken, if anybody's interested in jumping in here. I'll, I'll jump in. This is Ken. I just want to jump in and ask uh, when is when is the INFORM conference going to come back? Next so I think year. That's one of the best conferences around. Yeah, we will be back next year. Um, we just, we didn't have, there's not enough volunteers to do the virtual stuff that needs to be done. But we're gonna plan it ahead of time. Uh, I don't know if Anne will be there with me. I'm hoping she will be, um, but Inform will be back next year. Great, great. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. If you can. Todd, the, you other, the other good thing about virtual is uh, I've probably attended more conferences in the last <laughs> six months than I have in the last six years because yeah. they're, they're all everywhere right now virtually. So it's been great. Yeah, I took a new job last year and I, new compliance areas that I had to deal with. And I realized I did about 110 hours of training last year. I never could have done that in person. Never. Yeah. Yeah, so it's been else? really good. Todd, did you, were you going to say something? Todd, you're on mute. Mug. <laughs> <laughs> you're on mute, Todd. I don't see mute on my phone here. Let me check. Oh, now you're not you're now. Back. You're good now. All right, maybe I've got a voice activated mic that's uh, balky. Uh, we're having our uh, monthly chapter meeting this evening. I think the title of the presentation is something about digital pre digital transformation in the time of COVID. So I don't know if, it, if registration is still open. It's probably closed, but there might be a way around that in case you're interested. It's 6 o'clock Eastern. Okay. We'll take a look. We'll take a look. Anybody which else? Chapter, Todd, Todd, which chapter was that? Metro Maryland. Metro Maryland, okay. All right, I'm we're, too, we're at the half. I don't want to keep anybody any longer than we need to. Um, this has been great. I hope you'll come back and join us. Um, May, we're going to be focusing on higher education and institutional record and archive management. I know it's kind of a limited audience, but it is indeed an audience. So in your particular regions, if you have members in those arenas, um, keep them in the loop for us. We'll be sending out the communication this week. Um, in June, we'll be back just to network. We're gonna, you know, cocktails and talking at the end of the, the end of the year. So come back and join us. Thank you, everybody. Thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you all.